Good evening and welcome to The Velocity of Now with me, your host, Thomas Sheridan, hosted tonight on the realitybitesradio.com. That's bites with a buy with a by and thank you to paul and neil for hosting the show and doing the engineering as usual from now on we'll be starting at 11 o'clock and on here till midnight some nights we'll run over and we're not only on reality bites we're on uh, various stations all over the world and uh, i'm glad everybody's listening and you're paying attention and joining this conversation in such large numbers my website is thomas sheridan arts.com you want to help me out you can go buy a book there there's a little tab in the upper right hand corner called bookshop the show will also be featured on newsymbolsmedia.tv where i upload the youtube versions my youtube channel is thomas sheridan arts on youtube if you'd like to subscribe that'd be wonderful and anything you can do to help me that way even sharing articles from my new my website and sharing my videos it all helps in the end and thank you very much for doing that Tonight I want to talk on the show about the idea of suburbia and this, the idea of social isolation within suburbia and what where suburbia came from and what it is to be a suburbanite and what, what place the suburbs play in human society, in development, in culture, in arts, sociology, psychology and even how the infrastructure on the layout of the city and the suburbs affects people on a psychological and psychic level. Now I grew up in a basically in the city area and when I was about 17 we moved out to a suburb and it was horrible for me it was a tremendously difficult experience for starters it was so far away on the outskirts of Dublin it was very difficult for me to adapt to the distance to get into the city centre I can remember one day after a few weeks taking a bus back to where we lived from the city centre and the journey seemed so much shorter and it became very apparent to me early on that suburbia is about distance and that distance transfers to actual time in your life removed from it in terms of commuting now before we look at the idea of suburbia let's look at the idea of the city itself of the urban area now as you know i don't believe there's such things as coincidence in the sense that tremendous social and cultural changes don't exactly they don't happen by accident i subscribe very much to Carl Jung's idea of the collective unconscious and ideas of synchronicity and I very much believe that cities at certain points they almost perform the uh, the function of an alchemical vessel in that you pour all this potential all this human social political cultural psychological potential into and a densely packed urban area it's very sim- similar to the alchemist putting all the chemicals into the alchemical vessel when the vessel is cracked open you might get garbage you might get poison you might get an explosive substance or you might get gold now there was an article in the BBC in the recent times this week in fact a book is coming out about 1913 in Vienna and it's quite a remarkable story because it's it speaks of this idea of the city as the alchemical vessel and it's producing in this case something quite bad now in 1913 Adolf Hitler Leon Trotsky Tito the future leader of Yugoslavia Sigmund Freud and Stalin all lived in the city in fact I visited Vienna spent some time there a long time ago now about 20 years now and I stumbled upon by mistake a coffee shop that had a plaque on the wall outside it that showed that Stalin and Hitler had been in the coffee shop at the same time and I remember thinking this was incredible how could this be and sure enough it was and Vienna's place in history is not fully resolved in terms of people understanding the impact it had. It's a good case study for the idea of the city as the alchemical vessel in terms of its, defe- you know, its effect upon humanity. Now, we have to look at the context of Vienna at that time. It was the end of the Habsburg Empire. It was falling apart. 
it was losing its its grandeur and its power in the world and world war one was owned the great war as they call it was only one year away and so you would have had this kind of psychic flashpoint where all these these characters of the, these 20th century monsters for the most part and i include sigmund freud in that were all compacted in in this one area because on some level they were drawn to it for that reason it's like the line in the the stephen king book salem's lot where the main character says evil houses attract evil men and the same thing can happen with a city because although you could have a city that's booming and it's growing and there's all kinds of economic and other opportunities there's also a city dying also presents pathological opportunities you can create scapegoats in this case it would have been jews it would have been business people and that kind of idea now it doesn't always end you know it's not always bad you like the same time you had this going on we had the art of of klimt for example we had tremendous uh, developments in architecture within in vienna and we also and it wasn't that long after the music of strauss so there was there's always good things too but it, it, it just goes to show you that a city at a certain point is more than just a it's more than just a an urban area where people live there is a there is a a dynamic that's beyond what politicians or social planners or city councils can produce and it usually manifest manifest manifests itself through culture now you think of like liverpool in the 1960s in the mersey beat swinging london you had chicago and the jazz scene and same with new orleans in the 1930s and 40s when you had Memphis in Tennessee, where you had rock and roll, you had Chicago, uh, San Francisco in the 1960s, where you had the uh, Haight Ashbury, and so on and so on. It always develops like that. Where do we have it right now? I'm not so sure. It it doesn't doesn't seem to be a cultural hotspot at the moment because basically the the great magicians of this world are not artists anymore. Music means nothing. It's been overtaken by boy bands and these kinds of things and the arts has deteriorated enormously particularly the visual arts has been taken over by benefactors and multi-millionaires who who put enormous price tags on a few squiggles on a few paintings a lot of this has to do with money laundering too it's a way of, for money laundering and the music business has always been a, a big money laundering thing too that's why the mafia you read hammer of the gods by about the book about Led Zeppelin you, you just see how much money laundering goes on in in rock and roll you know cities develop these kinds of things we had Birmingham produced heavy metal not not surprisingly because of the industrial nature of that city the manufacturing nature of that city you would have like so you had Judas Priest and you had Black Sabbath and so on when I was growing up there was very much an idea of the city as the dystopia of the future specifically in science fiction science fiction always portrayed the cities of the world i'm talking about like the 1970s and the 1980s particularly in a very bleak and negative context you look at movies like uh, about the death of the city about the decay about the city falling apart about social breakdown and you had movies like escape from new york with kurt russell a very good action sci-fi film but again it shows us new york city in a state of absolute decay and ruin danger and just a completely difficult and impossible place for a a person to reside safely and that same idea existed in what also with new york was in the film silent green you had the 100 degrees all year round because of what they call greenhouse the greenhouse effect you had f cues for few food it was very much an orwellian soviet union dystopia and at the center of it you had this kind of human trafficking for food so that again a city is a dangerous place it's filled with violence it's filled with extreme temperatures it's a boiling point that's why they made a point in silent green 
with the the temperature all around it the idea of the, the you know the heat inside the alchemical vessel is not producing anything good london got a similar treatment and i'm sure people are going to quote on the youtube comments of other other cities but these are just off the top of my head i'm thinking of london in the superb tv movie from 1979 quite der Marst and the experiment with the brilliant john mills and again he got it be, the film begins with him in london itself it was actually a tv miniseries that became a movie but in the opening episode he enters the city of london and it's it's overrun by gangs similar to the gangs in that that film about the gangs in brooklyn called the warriors same kind of idea but they're much more violent and again this was made the context when ira bombs were going off in london and you have the same that kind of on a psychological and cultural level artistic level you had that meme reflected within quater mass and the experiment there are blockades where there's heavily armed police who tell people you can't go down that street you go down the street there's gangs you know they're kind of like dressed in leather and they're and denim and they have machine guns and shotguns and knives very much out at an urban mad max kind of a thing and then john mills enters into the tv studio and the tv studio is like the the oasis of away from violence within the city but what it produces is is ridiculous decadence and uh, fluff which has all come true so a generation starting with the 50s 60s 70s particularly it took up in the 70s and 80s the idea was that the city was a failed institution that the large city was no place for a normal person to live no place for a, for a safe person to want to be safe and it was only a matter of time before it fell apart and in reality we got the precise opposite you look at manhattan today it didn't become snake Pliskin's escape from new york prison manhattan it's basically called millionaire's island now i lived in new york for many years i loved it when it was it was a skanky run down place i loved walking down 42nd street at two o'clock three o'clock and four o'clock in the morning after band practice i loved the color of the characters on the street i loved the smell of the city i loved the door to the city i loved the I just love that because that was creating culture it was creating personality the f the decay of new york in the 70s and up until the mid 80s to the mid late 80s was to me the the lines on the face of a person was a really you know amazing story to tell in their face the wrinkles and so on new york is is, a, is a quite an old city by american standards and has a a tremendous social and human history contained within it probably unique to anywhere in the world and i felt that i was you know as a young guy i was living in this this kind of continuation of that and i, I just soaked it all up and then rudolph giuliani became mayor of new york and he brought in a zero tolerance policy and he ripped the heart and soul out of that city with his gentrification i can remember the day i saw the warner brothers or disney store going up on the corner of 42nd street in times square and i'm thinking to myself that i'm not going to be in new york much longer this is not the same city that i fell in love with and hundreds of thousands of people like me living in new york people who were in bands artists we all left we all left because there was less and less places to for us to be in rents became incredibly expensive and more and more yuppies and bankers and stockbrokers and millionaires moved in and for a while i put my hand to trying living like that i was working as a graphic designer and making good money but it was still it wasn't what i wanted i found it was it just it didn't feel right in my soul because a city or a countryside or a small village or even a farm in the middle of nowhere you've got to be in your kind of psychic groove with it or it's not it's not ever going to feel right so the exact opposite of what happened in the movie the plot line in the movie escape from new york is what took place in reverse it became gentrified and new york is now millionaire's island 
And the same thing happened in London. London has become almost impossible for anyone who is not rich to live in the centre of London. You had the Docklands, who was probably the last indigenous working class, indigenous London, you know, people living in that city. Probably with some of those bloodlines going right back to the Romans, at least of the very earliest going back to the Normans, but some of them would have went right back to the Romans. And these people had lived there for centuries. They survived the bombing in World War Two. They survived the changes in shipping towards containerization, and suddenly you had a whole culture in the East End of London that was surplus to economic mandates. And with that, you had the conversion from the east end of London and the Docklands, Isle of Dogs and these places into what we have today, Canary Wharf and the Docklands district. And now the ships of commerce are electronic numbers that rattle on a screen. And again, London has become a millionaire's enclave. People who, the artists, the poets, Everyone else like that has been moved out. They can't afford to live there. Dublin has gone the same way too. And many other English-speaking cities are the same way too. So, when you have this gentrification, you had, initially, you had this idea of the city as a dystopia. And then you have this idea of the city being too expensive. The dystopia never manifested, but the, the millionaire's enclaves and the millionaire's islands developed within the city centres. There was a diaspora, and these were people who ended up in the suburbs. So they're refugees. That's the only way to really think of these people. They don't consider themselves refugees, but they are refugees. There's no difference between someone who's been priced out of the centre of London and someone who's been moved off their land in the Amazon. There's no difference between a working class or a middle class person priced out of New York and someone who's been moved off their land in Mexico to build a big Monsanto corn farm. It's exactly the same thing. You see, this is one of the this is one of the realities. We don't because we're so compartmentalized as people and we have this kind of psychopathic system ruling over us. Nobody sits back and they want everyone to not relate to everyone else. So no no one who's actually been driven out of Brooklyn into Long Island or driven out of London into, you know, way up into, into Essex, none of them will ever say to themselves, I'm a refugee, I'm an economic refugee, because I'm not. I, I don't compare myself to those people, but you are. That's exactly what you are. The scale may be different, but the reality is the same you're still an economic refugee of sorts. So then you have the cities being, you know, purged of basically the the, 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 the people, the cultures, the microcultures, the the different layers. Now you do get you know, they, they do give you these these multicultural things where you get immigrant groups moving in and that's a good thing. You know me, I'm a huge I'm a huge fan of organic multiculturalism. I love anywhere in the world where different cultures are trade. I, that's why I'm not anti-capitalist, because I see how trade brings people together more than any cultural Marxist or politically correct mandate from central government ever will. All you have to do is go to like the Lower East Side of New York or Harlem or Brick Lane in London, anywhere, any, any of these places, and you see how trade brings people together. Now that's 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 the that's one good thing, okay. But the re the reality is that there's still a disenfranchised, removed out population that doesn't know it's been affected. And if you grew up in a city, you'll be familiar with this story, particularly if you grew up in the United States. This idea of white flight, this idea that it, the neighborhood is changing, which is code word in American neighborhoods for, you know, non whites are moving in. That's what that is. It's just a code word. The neighborhood is changing. And so you have fleeing, a kind of a fleeing thing. Now, what these people are fleeing is subconscious fears that were placed into their heads by seeing these films like Escape from New York, to seeing all these, these ideas of, of urban dystopia, that we better run, we better retreat further into the margins, deeper and farther into the hinterland. 
until we're away from these uh, these sinister people, these sinister new people who don't look like us, have different cultures than us, and we must run, we must flee. And this has served the the the, the elites and the establishment very well because as the working classes and the middle lower middle class and the middle classes leave, leave large cities such as London and Manhattan, new, Manhattan and everywhere, they're not replaced necessarily by immigrants from other countries they're often replaced in many cases by wealthy neo-aristocrats or nouveau riche aristocrats from their own country so it's like a land grab in many ways it's a big huge land grab by the the wealthy the super wealthy taking the land off the true social engineering removing the land from the middle classes from the working classes and even many of the immigrants and replacing them with high-rise buildings luxury apartments luxury condos luxury everything this that and the other office buildings hotels so you have a land grab so it suited them now this before i get to the actual you know the idea of the suburb as a sinister place and it is a it is a very sinister place in many ways uh, this the, the suburb the pristine suburb of the manicured lawn and you know the perfect house and keeping up with the Joneses is, is in many ways far more dangerous than the the dystopia portrayed in movies up from the 1980s and 70s of the urban problems. Initially the idea of suburbs came out of what they called model model villages. These were or model towns. These were usually built by industrialists. The industrialist would under the sort a not kind of an alt altruistic idea would build a better standard of housing for his workers to very close to his factory in these Victorian model villages. Now one of the first ones that really is quite famous is Saltair, which is near Bradford in West Yorkshire. And it was built by a woolen magnate called Titus Salt. Now the village is very pretty. It was pretty today because there's no, you know, heavy industry going on. You know, it's got these very attractive brownstone buildings that you see all over Yorkshire. And yes, while it's true that Sir Titus Salt did move the people into a better accommodation in the suburban area, at the same time they were also made prisoners. Because if you if you know if if Mister Salt Dan Min gives you a gives you a nice a nicer house than what you were used to, well, you're not going to do anything like strike. You're not going to do anything like that. You're not going to call it rock the boat. You're going to do everything you're told in order to keep that nice roof over your head. So it really isn't an altruistic kind of idea. It's almost like an economic protection racket. That uh, you wouldn't want anything to happen to that nice house of yours. Well, you better not. You better not do this, or you'll be back in the slums of Bradford. So it's it wasn't necessarily altruistic. Another example of this is Port Sunlight, which is on the Wirral near Liverpool, and that was built by Lever, the guy who found the you know Lever Brothers and Sunlight washing up liquid and everything. That's why it's called Port Sunlight. It's called Unilever today, and again, very attractive very much prettier was a much better standard of living for many people than than the one than what they had in liverpool in the slums but at the same time what happens you are a a slave you're in a gilded cage you cannot rock the boat now this inspired other industrialists around the world you had ibm had been doing it with outside their factory and so had Kodak in Rochester, New York. In fact, IBM, you were given all kinds of discounts to live in, you know, a nearby house for IBM. But it was also you you were, it went it went further because it's Americans. They went actually further because Ameri you know r Americans are raised to worship, you know, capitalism. But at in a if you were part of the IBM family, and this is the kind of language they used, they were given a book. IBM salesmen and programmers were given books to take of songs that they used to take home. And they were expected to sing these IBM hymns, I kid you not, with the family after Sunday dinner. <coughs> 
they would sing these hymns, you know, I'm an IBA, IBM man, I make the best computers in the world. I mean, it sounds Monty Python now, but I'm not, I can guarantee you that uh, there were families sitting around where their father says, okay, we've had some nice dessert, my dear. And now we're going to sing the, the IBM song. And they would sing it. And then, you know, these kids would probably grow up to be serial killers or something. who are growing up in these kinds of families. Another one was Grummond. See, I'm talking about here about the development of the suburb. The development of the suburb has never been about anything other than driving an economic mandate. You had Grummond on Long Island, the most horrifically suburban place on earth, I think. And Grummond were a defence manufacturer, and they actually built a whole town, a whole suburb called Grummond. And again, you were a Grummond man. You were in there, and you were on the on call, and you, you did what the company said. Because it didn't only, it, it literally didn't, it did make the difference about a, a roof over your head. Because you were being, held, you know, you were being paid a salary. And this is also another way they could drop the salary. And also these companies got huge tax breaks for building staff houses. So you have this, this drive through the model village into the idea of the, of the, the prison suburb. Where you have a much nicer house. And you're taken care of by the owners. And we still have that today. Except that the houses are. Sorry the houses are dependent upon things like shopping malls. And school districts. Remember one of the primary functions of a suburb. Is that it's a, it's a factory for the production of children. A factory for the production of children. To later on become taxpayers. And that's why politicians will do everything to get land zoned further and further out. Because if there's more and more people living in his, his or her electoral district. There's more and more people to vote and keep him and his kids in the same political system in power. But at the same time too the economic opportunities in the suburb. In the suburbs are not the same as they are in the city so we're back to the idea of commuting now commuting is time and commuting distances get further and further out doesn't matter if you're taking the train you're driving you're taking the bus you're having a period removed from your existence where you're not actually productive where you're not actually living for yourself and then this itself becomes a an, an economic unit itself because what do you listen to while you're on the Long Island Expressway or the Santa Monica Freeway or on the train what do you listen to you listen to the radio and the radio is an economic device it sells advertising it informs you on things you don't really need to know about gives you the news every five seconds the weather every things you do not need to know about even the traffic updates are useless the traffic updates are useless because if you're stuck on a, a highway or a motorway and it says we've got backups between junction you know 67 and and four and 73 it doesn't matter if you your chances are you'll be in that either in that or behind it and there's no way you can get off it because there's no alternative to that motorway other than that impending traffic thing up ahead stress builds up you know you're drinking more of that coffee that you pick up you're, you're, you're having less quality of life because you're now in a, in a kind of a, a twilight zone between working in the job and living your life so that goes on five days a week back and forth back and forth so there's no time in that gap to develop culture you look at the one of the reasons the Icelandic sagas are so amazing and so vast is because of the the long winters that they spent inside the Icelandic homes weaving and doing crafts and telling stories that's where that came from they were stuck in that house with that fire during the long northern winters but culture developed culture fostered no culture develops in that in the suburban flux between urban and suburban in terms of commuting in fact any culture that exists there is very much 
a top down thing because your shock jock your radio dj or the weatherman is determining it or the songs on the radio so already you're a highly disadvantaged human being compared to your ancestors you're not developing a culture you don't have a culture you're a prisoner of commuting commuting has replaced your culture and you go to work and then you go back home in the evening you go back to suburbia what is in suburbia for you there's a tv and there's not much else there really isn't an awful lot else now i'm a firm believer that if you're a uh, anyway a person who can escape in your mind through a hobby through the enjoyment of your family through your enjoyment of your own mind you doesn't matter if you live in a suburb you can still have a, a kind of an internal magical existence when i was stuck in that suburb as, as a teenager I had no money and no means to get out i had a sketchbook and i just lost myself in drawing and writing so it, it didn't really matter in the end of the day but the alternative was to sit in front of the tv that probably would have driven me mad and it does drive a lot of people mad the manifestations of this are things like you see black friday have you ever seen black friday happen in an urban area no it's always in the suburbs because that's all the time they haven't had to get out their animal instincts their their feet their, their energies have not been vented that that in order to get you know a dvd player that's not that much of a discount they will claw another person's eyeballs out that's all repressed anger that's all hidden anger you see i don't i don't talk conspiracy theories i don't i, I don't do things like that i hate that term the truth movement i hate all those ideas i hate the whole truth movement in fact it disgusts me it's a despicable thing but i do i do come from the I do come from the lineage of the old 1960s John Lennon realist magazine kind of you know confidential magazine magazine conspiracy researcher interested person I'm 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 proud to call myself an old-fashioned conspiracy theorist because I grew up and people like my generation grew up in the wake of the Birmingham 6 the Guildford 4 Watergate Greenham Common, weapons of mass destruction. We don't need that truth or stuff to tell us that the world is screwed up. It's only if you didn't know that, you know, the world was run by psychopaths that you'd actually be shocked and become a truther. The rest of us were aware that things were wrong from the time we were kids. We didn't need Alex Jones or David Icke to tell us that what, we, what, we, we were, what was obvious to us. That's why I think it's more insane. It's more, it's, it's more of a sign of insanity for someone to say there are no conspiracies which many people today do they've been coached very successfully by these kinds of shows like Mythbusters and all this other nonsense and also you have in fact you have people like David Icke saying you know the world is run by walking crocking crocodiles doesn't help anybody else either doesn't help you make a case either which is probably what it's designed for but at the same time too it's more insane to say there's no conspiracies than to see conspiracies everywhere. There's, there's more insanity in, in living in this airy-fairy world where, you know, authority figures are wonderful, whether it be your college professor, your prime minister, your president, or, you know, some leadership person, some load of money, than to say there isn't. They, they're all infallible, and they all should be trusted automatically. Or just, that's like saying, oh, look, they, they had the Borgias, and they had the, you know, Nero, and you had all these, like, the... Uh, all these corrupt families in the past but it will never happen today that's where that comes from so i'm not that's that's where i come from i just i look at the world at this stage in my life and I, I i look back and i see patterns and i see patterns that are either conducive to human happiness and the 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 empowerment of human experience on this earth and i saw i see things that rot them that rots that and one of the things that rots it is suburbia it rots it we do not develop cultures in suburbia even there was rich cultures there was rich cultures and mythologies existed in urban areas you know you had look you did you had like all kinds of st i grew you know i grew up in central in inner city dublin there was a very rich kind of mythology 
about certain streets where I held that this horseman lived or a, a max murderer and he's kind of afraid to go down them at night or churches that you went around three times you saw the devil these are all amazing things this is all the shadow this is all the shadow side of you being indulged what's the shadow in the suburbs a video game or being afraid that your neighbours will talk about you because you don't have the right curtains on your on your feckin' house. We had real shadows in the city when I was a kid. In fact, even people that grew up in like the East End of London, they would have had shadows like stories of Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper would have been one. That kind of thing. spring Hill Jack is a classic example of that. And that all that all dwindled in in in, in, in this app from the seventies on. It dwindled as television and marketing and culture and X Files and things like that became your your mythology. And Star Trek and Star Wars that became your mythology and replaced your your natural one. Just business. That's all. It's not, it wasn't a conspiracy. It wasn't a plot. It's just business. There's money in archetypes just as much as there's money in mythology, just as much as there's money in fried chicken and sex money and everything and if there's a business opportunity whether it's 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 the idea of getting cash to indulge something deep within your archetypal subconscious they will do it just as much as it does to your sexual organs doesn't matter just business and there's money everywhere and they've watched you speaking of vienna edward Bernays, sigmund freud's nephew he came to America with all this, his uncle's psychoanalytical tools. And they got inside your head and developed a new economy. The economy of the psyche. The economy of the self. So no culture was developed. And, the, and people lived in, you know, in, in, in that movie, The Craze, there's a great scene where you had like the old actor. I think it was Jimmy Jewell telling the kids about the time I saw Jack the Ripper. I mean, I used to love stories like that when I was a kid. You know, like when old guys used to tell you a story like that, don't go down that street, there's a headless horse. They're fantastic. You were scared, but you were thrilled at the same time too. What's the last time you had something like that? Oh, uh, I know. Fred and Rosemary West. You see, they, they, they became real horrors. Liverpool, you had Jamie Bolger. And you have that debt cult that's around that poor child. You have the newspaper still celebrated every year. So it poisons the cities. It doesn't. It doesn't give them any 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 real folklore, good or bad. But the suburbs develop nothing. They develop neurotics, neurotics and neuroses. Because the street layouts. If you look at the street like like that song by Rush, Subdivisions. That's a that's an amazing song lyrically. You should look that up. But that song "Subdivisions" by Rush set, Rush says it all. It you know, it it's a mass production zone for the production of mediocrity. That's what the the suburbs are. I would go farther as saying that the street layouts are are gigantic sigils in order to generate mass conformity. And suburbs were driven by the auto industry, particularly in America. General Motors, it's been shown in, you know, that it's out there. You can see it. They were fined a dollar, one dollar they were found. They bought up all the interurban rail systems in America and they, they deliberately trashed them, let them fall apart. Firestone Tires, Goodyear, and General Motors bought up all these interurban rail systems and built made people dependent on the car and the highway and then that's what the sub rezoned the land the subdivisions from that point out and then you have the good old shopping mall all the same not only in all over america and all over you but all over the world they're starting to look the same the same stores and everything and that's the escape you go in there to escape and people don't know any better the sigils of conformity in the streetscapes of the cities unleashes monsters. These monsters are seen in things like the movie Bowling for Columbine, what happened at Columbine High School, and all these other mass shootings in American schools. They unleash irrational fears of people of other races. Oh my God, the Muslims are going to come in and bomb us out of our suburban conformity. The movie The Breakfast Club, I thought, brilliantly showed that. 
that the only one, the character played by Judge Hurt, the only one that had a real spark of life to him, as well as the the girl who was kind of like the quiet one. They were the only two that had actually escaped with inside themselves, and they were the biggest misfits. And yet they were the most, they were the least screwed up of the whole bunch of them. The other ones who were all conformist were them far more screwed up and messed up. And that's suburbia for you. It doesn't align with your psyche. It doesn't make you feel clean. Anyone who's grown up in the city, and I don't care what anyone says. Now, a lot of the, uh, you have to remember, like in America, a reason why the suburbs developed, particularly around the large cities, was after World War Two. You had the the men who came back from World War Two. They would have seen people's heads blown off. They would have seen horrors like you wouldn't imagine. A way of dealing with their post-traumatic stress was to get them married, have them having kids and stick them in suburbia. And in the early days of suburbia, not just in the United States but in Ireland and England everywhere, kids did play on the streets. They did. Up until the 80s. I used to see armies of kids. Up until, up until the early 90s, you would see armies and armies of kids on the streets of all the suburbs everywhere playing and then it's got all gone now. They've all retreated further into the box. So the first initial retreat was the imaginary dystopia out from the urban cities. The second retreat was into the suburbs themselves, into the sigils of conformity of the subdivisions. And then the third retreat is into the house itself. They don't know who their neighbours are. The kids don't play with anyone down the street. Play is now a commodity. They have to be brought to somewhere to play. The kids have to play soccer. They have to go this. They have to go to dancing lessons. All this costs money. The retreat is deeper. The next level is to retreat into the internet. So there's a constant stage of retreat, further and further deeper in. It's the opposite of a flower unfolding. It's almost like it's it's a form of entropy, social entropy dropping down and the driver is not conspiracy it's not feckin' lizards it's not illuminati that doesn't exist the driver is psychopathic business models corporatism the idea of conformity corp co- co- corporations cor- large corporations require standardization and conformity to increase their business model And that's all that is. And the, stu- the suburb is a, a standard product. It is the Walmart. The, it is the Tesco of human existence. There was a, Now, what's the positive sides of that? Well, I can tell you, when I was in growing up, when I was living in New York, you would get the coolest people were the people who broke from the suburban mold. And ended up living when you could afford to do it in like in, in cheap apartments and stuff in Manhattan, getting into the music and the art scenes. They were so determined to reverse engineer themselves out of that conformity to go back. And they'd often be some of the coolest people you'd ever meet. Some of the most interesting kids you'd ever meet. Because what happened was while they were in suburbia, and this is why suburb you know, you see these kids, they become goths and this kind of thing, or metalheads and suburb they're trying they're desperately trying to escape. When you see that fat girl in suburbia who's dressed all in black with the black lipstick, what that child is doing, and she's a child, she'll only be 15, 16, what she is trying to do is to desperately escape the paralyzing conformity which corporatism and politics has inflicted upon her in the suburbs. She's desperately trying. And I, I can, I'll can, give you an example of it. I was standing in Bayside, New York. Now, you want to talk about a conformist suburb in Queens in New York on the border of Long Island and Queens, which is part of the, one of the boroughs of New York City. And right on the border there, the Cross Island Expressway meets the I was one the uh, Northern Boulevard. It is as it's as suburbia as you can get. It's like one of the flashpoints, like one of the nodes, like the nodes on a sigil where the two lines meet, or the connection point on a circuit board where the two lines meet. It was where you got to everywhere. So it was suburbia central. And I and the, the, the train station was on the line to a place called Port Washington. It's as white bread suburb as you can get and all these towns like Little Neck and Great Neck and Manhasset all like 
pure American suburbia in between. And I, I can remember sitting on the stage, standing on the station one Saturday afternoon with my guitar case. I was dressed all in black because I was cool. As it was, and this in the eight. Remember back in the eighties, dressing black in the middle of the eighties. That was a subversive thing, especially when everyone had the feckin' poodle haircuts and wore purples and and turquoise. But anyway, I, I remember I, I was standing on the train station and the Long Island Railroad, waiting for the train to take me to Manhattan to go to band rehearsal, and the tr- a train going the other direction toward Port Washington pulled along and stopped. So you were stopped on the opposite platform, and the people. I, the people on the oh, this is nineteen eighty seven, I think, and the people on the other side of the train, on the other train across the other side, were staring at me. But I had like you know, I had big like the, I I wasn't say I wasn't as out, like I didn't have as much hair as Robert Smith, and I wasn't wearing makeup. I just had black hair. I dyed even blacker, make a blue black, and I had a black short, which is nothing weird, and a pair of black trousers and a pair of black boots. And they were pointing and looking at me like they had seen a creature from another planet. And that was the difference. That was the gulf that was created. I'll never forget that. It was, it, it, I mean, they were staring at me. I mean, it's, uh, and, and, they, they, and it wasn't just a case that they would have a quick laugh and giggle. They would stare at you like they were looking at something they couldn't recognize. Like they're waiting for some kind of being to materialize from the mist. And that happened me so much. And I wasn't even at that out there. And, that, and then, you know, five, ten years later, everyone, all those people in the suburbs are all wearing the same clothes that I was wearing. And it's the norm. The a spell, it's a big, huge, magical spell of conformity. The, the idea of the house, the lawn. I mean, what is a lawn? A lawn is the most useless thing in the world. And yet is the de facto, the de facto piece of infrastructure that determines your suburban existence. You have a lawn in front of your house. Or at the, maybe even at the back. A lawn that doesn't produce anything. An absolute waste of space. Useless, pointless, like these green belts they build between suburbs, these green belts where nothing can live in them because animals can't actually get into them unless they have a pair of wings. And the ones that can fly in there are mostly, you know, things you would see in a town park anyway. And they're supposed to break up the urban area and they're, most of them are gone now because they've been filled in. These token gr- heats and greens they put in these suburbs. Look, a bit of green, a bit of, a bit of grass that's we cut every year. Where the wind blows across and it's bleak, especially the ones in Ireland. Oh my God, they 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 produce nothing, no trees anywhere. That's was, that's the big one. That was the one thing that I did love about the American suburbs. There was trees everywhere. So all the men came out in America. They went out to World War Two. They went out to places on Long Island, like Amityville, where I did a show about the DeFeo murders recently. Those kinds of places. Florida is one gigantic suburb, and. You you were lucky if you get to know nice people. I can remember when I lived in Bayside. I got to know the neighbours, and the and they were two an elderly couple, very interesting couple. And the only reason I got to know them was because they were farmers who had actually farmed the land before it had become a suburb. So they had a history, and they knew how to talk to people. They knew how to interact with people. Everyone else around me was an absolute bleeding nutcase, a, a, an absolute mental nutcase. And that's saying it's because of America. Like, there are full, Irish suburbs are full of nutcases as well. British ones, they're all the same. Nutcases, keeping up with the Joneses. Me- mentally ill. Unable to function. And then passing judgment on everyone else. And then you have the new, you know, the new commuter belt. The new conveyor belt of... SSRIs and other drugs pouring into these areas and because people are socially isolated more and more within these suburbs what happens then is they're starved for attention there's an infantilization and infantilism develops they're starved for attention and this is where the reality shows come from this is why they have to be on a bleeding reality show the housewives of the Jersey Shore 
Essex girls. Blah, blah, blah. Big brother. All of them. Just get me on TV. Please, God, let someone notice we exist. Let someone notice we exist. Jeremy Kyle. Jerry Springer. It's th- these people are desperate. Desperate for validation of their own existence. That has been overcompensated by creating this massive need to be noticed. This massive insecure. Please notice me. I don't relate to anyone in my community. I don't know who any of my neighbours are. I don't even say hello to them when I go to work in the morning. They don't say hello to me. All I know of them is that flickering of the large screen TV in the house at night, in the different rooms. That's all I know about them. I know nothing else. I'm occasionally in summer, I might get a smell of the barbecue in the backyard and hear the music playing. Or a car moving in and out. But I, please, someone pay me attention. Communicate with me. And that's what a reality TV show is about. It has replaced the community, the characters, where the people used to hang out together, hang out on the streets. I lived, I was down in Atlanta, no, I was in Birmingham, Alabama, and a friend of mine down there told me that air conditioning and cable TV destroyed the South. The Deep South was destroyed by cable, by cable TV and by air conditioning. People used to sit out on their stoops, on their porches, and they used to hang out and socialise all in the hot weather because it was too hot inside. Cable TV, another commodity, air conditioning, facilitates it, brought them indoors, and next thing you know, the culture's dead, and you don't get girls talking with that southern drawl anymore. A sexy southern girls, they all sound like Buffy. They all have that Buffy 90210 accent, all over American or wherever you go. Unless they grow up in the country, you might, you might, you might be lucky. So then you have the suburban exclusivity. On one side of us, there is the dystopia of the urban area filled with minorities. My mother says there's a lot of people in there. There are minorities. And then the other side, out in the far distant unknown, as Rush said, you have hillbillies and rednecks as portrayed by movies like Deliverance. And then you have the siege mentality in the suburb. The far unlit of known, full of uh, fellas who play banjos and who were like, you know, rape you like a pig, bah. And then the city full of minorities and you're stuck in the middle and the compression gets darker and stronger. And the safety valves are offered to you, the panaceas, entertainment, movies, Black Friday, SSRIs. Produce more children, create children, worship children. Worship your children like gods. Not because you genuinely love them. Because they're as much as a status symbol. As your car. As your, f- your fancy house. My child is on the honours list. It's really dark when you start looking at it. And that's why I have tremendous respect for anyone who can break that mold in suburbia, either by in their own minds creating a a vacuum, I won't say a vacuum, it's quite the opposite of a vacuum, shall we say a a an island of sanity in their home, where they're not like that, where they've rejected all that. That's fantastic. I know people like that, and it's a wonderful thing. It doesn't really matter, they just have a roof over their head to keep them cold cold and cool in summer and warm in winter. Where they can prepare food and be a proper family. Or a family, you know, whatever they can be. Two people or one person. They can escape inside. But that's that's becoming a rare thing. It's not because people are not educated in it. Because the suburb does not... The suburb, the suburban monster. Suburbia. The demon of suburbia. The sigil of conformity. The streetscape of an psychic annihilation. Does not allow individual thinking. And so that's very difficult. It's very difficult on lots of levels. Like you, this, you know, you have to watch this latest TV show. You have to watch this, and the kids go to school. And my parents, you know, did you see the latest the thing on TV last night? Oh, my parents don't. We don't watch TV. You're weird. That kind of thing. You didn't watch the Oscars. My mom and dad watched the Oscars. You didn't watch. Your mom and dad don't watch the Oscars. Whisper, 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 whisper. Strange, different people, different people. Whisper, whisper, whisper.
I would like to see a way out of this would be for maybe suburbs to decay. And it's happening. In Detroit, the suburbs are falling apart. The city itself is falling apart. But not just the inner core of Detroit is dying, but the suburbs are dying. And I'm hearing and reading wonderful stories about artists moving into these old houses and buildings in Detroit and reclaiming them. And for the first time since General Motors made a gigantic model village of Detroit and made everyone in in Detroit dependent upon the auto industry, for the first time in probably 70, 80 years, Detroit is now developing a culture. A phoenix of culture is rising from the ashes. So my attitude would be let the suburbs die. Let them fall apart and give the people who live in them a reason to exist instead of being refugees on the run from corporate control their consciousness insurgents rebuilding a new reality for themselves so let the suburbs die and take back the cities stop thinking of cities as dystopias that that mind control program that was placed in our heads where they're dangerous places you can't go into them they're full of terrorists now the cities are filled with amazing art galleries they're fit they're filled with incredible buildings you can walk around and and just look at the buildings look at the architecture stop pause they have shops that are different they have strange back alleyways that are so interesting and explore them reclaim the city take the city back from the millionaires and give it back to yourself at the same time too stop living in fear of suburbia most of us can't help where we've gone i'm sure there's many people listening to this are very happy living in suburbia and good luck to you but learn to if you live on the outskirts of london learn to go into london and look at the art galleries any city doesn't matter bristol liverpool dublin manchester new york san francisco bear anywhere Get back into the city and look at what your ancestors used to have around them. Reclaim it. You don't have to own it in a financial sense, in an ownership sense, but you can own it in a cultural sense. And you're amazed how much this does for you. To get lost in a city can be an amazing thing. It can be the nearest thing we can have today to a secret journey of entering the labyrinth. I used to do that all the time. I still do it. When I go to a foreign city, I make sure to get lost in the areas. I always follow the smells. Smells are a great way to discover a city. Follow the smells of strange foods and you're going to have an amazing time. Explore. And you be, and it's funny, it's almost like the city then becomes almost like a wild environment. Because what you're exploring then is with your senses. You're alive. Will I go around this corner? Will I be shot by a drug dealer? I know it sounds stupid, but I used to do it all the time. I used to walk through the Dublin Docklands late at night. Now, the you know, old industrial Docklands and and see the most amazing things like ships being repaired at like two in the morning because i couldn't sleep or something like that so i hope you enjoyed the show tonight i hope i've given you food for thought and uh, any comments you have leave them on the videos or on anywhere you know to get me on my blog and anywhere like that or email me thomas Thomas Sheridan Arts on YouTube, New Symbols Media TV. This has been me again on RealityBytesRadio.com. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, all the affiliate radio stations. And uh, as I say every week, and I'll always say for the rest of my life, feck them if they can't take a joke.